Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Jordan back again with PictureMonk.com. This is the 16th episode of the Picture Monk podcast, and uh, let's go ahead and get right into it. I'm, I'm not going to mess around because I'm recording this at 12.15 a.m. on Sunday, and I'm very tired. <laughs> and uh, uh, the reason I record, I'm recording this so late is because I was actually watching um, the UFC pay-per-view that was just on uh, UFC 184, I think. And uh, I was just finishing that up, and and after that, I was going to record the podcast. So that's one thing you don't know about me is I'm I'm big into UFC and mixed martial arts and stuff. So, but anyway, I'm really tired, and I want to try to get this nailed uh, and, and get this done. So uh, let's go and get this started. Uh, the first thing I kind of want to discuss and kind of go over real quick is the the passing of Leonard Nimoy. Uh, he was uh, famously known for playing Spock on um, on Star Trek. And you may wonder what that has to do with photography. And basically it has to do with, because I was, I was looking up stuff about him and found that he is, uh, or he was very, very big into photography. And you can kind of go and, and do a, a quick Google search on him to find, uh, the article that I'm looking at. But I'll go ahead and, and pop it into the show notes for this episode. And it was an article that Petapixel put out, which shows, uh, I think it's two videos that he did. Uh, one's an, a very old, old interview that he did, um, with a magazine or, or, uh, or establishment called The Republican. And then there's also another re- more recent interview that he did with Pharrell Williams. And, uh, they basically just go back and forth and, and Pharrell kind of asked him about photography and how he got into it and stuff like that. Um, you know, who knew these guys were big into photography? These, these actors and stuff were big into photography because, you know, he's not the, the first one that I, I have heard of. I mean, even, even, uh, Drew Carey, uh, he's the comedian that, uh, he, I think now he hosts the Price is Right and he used to do who, whose line is it anyway? He is big into photography and, uh, I saw him taking pictures, sideline photos at sporting events. Let's see. Another one was, uh, I think it's Randy Johnson, the pitcher. Uh, he, you know, he was taking, um, the photos at, at, at baseball games and football games and stuff. So, I mean, who knew that all these people were into, uh, into photography. So, um, it's a really, really neat inter- uh, interview with him. Really, uh, really cool stuff. And, and I will say that some of his stuff or a majority of his stuff, it looks like, uh, is, uh, what you consider like new, uh, nude artsy photos and stuff. Um, but so not safe for work, but, um, the theory behind how he's taking photos and, and you know, the, the, the thought behind some of that stuff is really kind of cool to listen to. So, uh, and he actually has a quote on the Petapixel site that shows, um, the kind of resistance that can be met if you're somebody trying to get into something else. And the quote that he put out was, uh, being known in one area of the arts and wanting to move into another is complicated. In a certain way, you get attention for being who you are, but you also get certain amount of, res- of resistance. And I thought that was kind of a, kind of a cool thing. Um, because, you know, you, he might be famous for his photography and you might look at his photography and, and say, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of stupid, which, I'm not going to lie. One of them, one of the pieces I did look at and I was like, what, what the heck is this? Um, but you know, you kind of, you know, he might have his stuff shown in galleries just for being Leonard Nimoy. So that's, you know, that's one thing that many people would, would, um, would think about, but being met with resistance because you might look at him and say, you know, why would he want to do that when he's, you know, a famous actor and, you know, obviously he's, he's set for life. So, you know, it's it's kind of a cool thing to listen to and listen to his his thought process and his uh, and his chosen art. Um, so they 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 kind of go co call him his his other career is photography. So um, so I just wanted to kind of kind of do that because uh, you know he he just passed this recently, um, and uh, I think it was on Friday uh, this past Friday. So um, that would be February twenty seventh. Yeah, February 27th of 2015, he passed, and uh, so I was looking up stuff about him and saw that he was into, into photography, so I thought I'd share that, and and uh, maybe you guys can go visit his stuff and check it out. All right, for this week's topic, uh, I'm going to basically be discussing landscape photography and just some quick things that, uh, that I've been trying to correct myself with my photography. 
and and they're not like you know buy a shutter release or they're not you know buy this sort of circular polarizer filter or something like that it's basically going to be uh sort of techniques and and some things that to to kind of think about when when going out there and 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 don't go for the the norm basically when you're trying to to try to do this and and again like kind of like I said in my last podcast uh, by no means am I a, am, am I a, a professional or um or or I consider myself a a, a you know a, an industry leader in certain things I'm just basically spouting out stuff that that matters to me and hopefully that will uh will help you guys out as well so uh take what you will from these from these little tips but um, let's go ahead and get into it. The first one is uh, is I normally try if I'm if I'm setting out to go to uh, landscape, you know, do landscape photography, and I and I really want to concentrate mainly on that. You know, I don't want to run and gun. I want to make sure I have my tripod with me, a really good sturdy tripod, and I want to make sure I have it set in in a good place. Um, you know, I'm 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 concentrating on this one subject, and I'm not just like setting it up, click, boom, go. Um, I try to meter for the highlights in the image. So what that basically means is, you know, let's say you're taking a picture of a sunset or something like that. You tr- you want to try to meter for the sunset or, you know, in that sort of realm. Because uh, what I used to do is set my tripod up and, and just, you know, I have, I have my, uh, my metering set on um, for center point focus or my center point. And, uh, so I would basically just point that in the center and wherever it metered, I would take the photo and then I should be like, ah, I'll just fix it later in Lightroom or Photoshop. But, uh, I'm trying to get better at metering for the highlights. So I'm metering for the sky. Um, and that's mainly, you know, if I'm doing, if I'm doing like, like I said, a sunset beach photo or something like that, I want to have that really awesome, bright, colorful sky. But if I meter for the water or the sand or the whatever it is, I'm going to have, the um, it's most likely the sky is going to be overexposed because I'm metering for a darker point in the photo. So I, I'm really trying to get better at metering for the sky because uh, if I'm not going to use any HDR for the photo, then metering for the sky will definitely allow me to bring back more shadows in the image, which most likely you'll have. So uh, I'm really trying to get better in that. So, uh, you know, next time you're out taking, you know, landscape shots or, I mean, it kind of works for people too, or any, any other kind of photography, try to measure for the highlights because you're going to, you're going to see a little bit differently and, um, you're going to, uh, to be able to recover different things in the image. So, um, you probably have known this by now if you listen to the podcast a lot that I really like the shadow slider in general. So no matter what, I'm probably going to bring that shadow slider and pull it up anyway. So that's why it's always helpful to meter for the highlights. So speaking of HDR, what I what I've been trying to do also is not shoot a lot of HDR. And this is basically due to uh, you know I've always shot raw and I've always been able to to bring back all the data I most likely would need shooting a raw file. But uh, shooting raw and and trying to to go into HDR all at the same time is just kind of a cluster. So uh, I went I went into HDR trying to figure that out and try to you know the newness of HDR sort of worn off a little bit and 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 that kind of thing and you know kind of the look of HDR has kind of gotten to me a little bit. So I've been just messing with the the raw photo and trying to get as much as I could out of that. Um, so I've been trying to stay away from HDR. So, uh, what I have done though, is I've kind of broken into a new HDR thing. At least it's new for me. And I'm actually going to be making a video on this week. Let me look at my calendar here. Uh, I'll actually be releasing it, uh, either this week or next week. And it has to do with a 32 bit HDR. And what that means is, uh, let's say if you're in Photomatix, most likely if you, when you take your three images, it blends them together and you, uh, you export it as a TIFF file because you want to edit it further. It's most likely going to be a 16 bit, uh, HDR image. So a 32 bit is basically double that. It has double the information. And a one way to, to really see the difference is to take that TIFF file bring it into Photoshop or Lightroom and mess with the sliders and you're going to see a difference of how much information is brought back and and how much information you're able to pull into it. So for example, uh, if you take the 
the uh, a regular raw file into Photoshop and you mess with the exposure slider, you're only going to get a plus five exposure or a minus five exposure. So you're only about to get five stops ahead or five stops below. Well, in a 32-bit file, Photoshop sees that it's a 32-bit or Lightroom sees it that it's a 32-bit and they uh, you get, basically get a 10 stop um, a 10 stop a, a 10 plus 10 stop or a, mi a minus 10 stop so you have so much more detail and that's just not just in the exposure slider you see that in all the other sliders like shadows highlights whites blacks you see them in all those stuff so uh, I actually have that video coming out and you can see the difference and and I'll show you how to uh, to to make a 32-bit HDR image you will need Photoshop to do it so yeah, I don't even go touch a uh, uh, photomatics so uh, look for that video. Follow me on YouTube. So it's youtube.com slash picture monk. And you can, uh, you'll be able to see the video when it comes up. And also follow me on my social media uh, feeds. Uh, I'll make sure to post it there too. So most likely uh, when it comes to photography and, and landscape photography in general, uh, the depth of field of your image is is vital because you know if you if you normally if you're taking portraits, uh, you want to have your depth of field low. So you'll you know you want to you know have that milky background. But in most of the time in landscape shots, you want to have the whole image in focus. You want to have no no shallow depth of field at all. So um, normally you you would hear to max out your your depth of field on your lens. So if you're if you have a normal you know 22 f 22 lens. Um, you're going to, to pop it all the way up to 22 and that will probably force you to be on a tripod unless it's a really, really bright day. Um, but you, uh, you most likely have it on F22, but I found that I don't really necessarily need that. Um, especially if I don't have a tripod, uh, an F22 is not going to let me, not going to let me handhold it at all unless I bump the ISO up and I don't, I don't really like to touch my ISO. So, um, what I basically try to do is is try to get into that sweet spot of the lens, and most of the time you've probably heard that as well. There is a certain sweet spot of a of most lenses out there, and I found that mine it just so happens it's easier for me to remember this. It just so happens that in my wide angle and my uh, twenty four millimeter twenty four to one hundred five, um, my sweet spot is around f sixteen on both of those. So it's really easy for for me to remember that. So if I really want to get a max depth of field. Uh, my sweet spot is usually around 16. I can kind of get away with uh, f14 or so, maybe f11 on my wide angle, just because of the fact that it is a wide angle. But I try to uh, I try to keep it in in the same realm. So um, you know, don't don't crank your eye your uh, your aperture up as as um, maybe you have been doing it to f22 because you kind of don't need that. Um, the only time you might need that is you, if you definitely want a slower shutter speed and maybe you're capturing waterfalls or, or a flowing river or something and you need to, to lose as much light as possible to get that motion. So that's the only time I, I, I've been trying to use it lately. So another thing about uh, landscape photography is most of the time you might you know, when you, when you think of landscape photography, what do you think of? You think wide open vistas, you think, you know, kind of panoramas may, maybe you may, you might think of those or, you know, you kind of think of that stuff, but making your photos in a different orientation might also help. So, and, and the reason I bring this up is because, um, one of my, one of the guys that I look up to, um, mainly not because of his photography, but because of his, of his marketing ability, is uh, Peter Lick. He's uh, that guy that sold the $6 million photo or something. I can't remember how much it is now. But uh, I went to his gallery, or one of his galleries, in uh, Las Vegas, uh, what was it, a couple of years ago, I think. And, um, you know, you walk through his gallery, you definitely see the wide open vistas, you see the large panoramas, you know, they're you know, six feet wide and all that kind of stuff. But some of the ones that really got me were the ones that were on columns in the, uh, in the, in the, in the gallery. And these columns were only probably about two feet wide, but he had really, really tall vertical photos. And they, you know, that's where he hung them was on the, was on the columns. And it's kind of cool because, you know, you, you might think of, you know, everybody has to shoot the, the landscape orientation, the horizontal orientation, uh, photos, but, you know, he kind of, he kind of took it a different way. He, you know, basically did a panorama, but vertical. 
And uh, it's it's really easy to do those. It's the same same method as doing a, a horizontal panorama. You're just tilting your body up. And um, one of them that he did it to, I believe, was um, I think it was in Hawaii. He did a picture of one of the the telescopes, um, the large telescopes in Hawaii, and um, at the Keck Observatory, I believe that's the one it was. And uh, he got the picture of the the Milky Way up there and everything, and it was just a really tall image, but it, it kind of stands out because it's different. So, um, you know, when you go out there, get the get the horizontal shots definitely, get you know all the shots that you normally do, but look for those other things. So, you know, if there's you know a really tall tree and you want to kind of capture that, you know, get a vertical, maybe even do the vertical panorama, test that out, and. Um, you know, you, you'll be able to, to get a different perspective and, and people might look at that and be like, Oh, look at that. I mean, I've never seen something like that before. And that's what you want. You want that emotion. You want that, that newness that people haven't seen before. All right. And the last little tip is, um, is basically getting low. So it's not like get low. It's not like, <laughs> it's not like that. It's, um, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta get in a, in a lower perspective. You gotta get in a lower, a lower register to take your photos. So, uh, a lot of people, you know, they'll they'll go out, take their tripod, and pop it up eye level, start taking photos. That's great. I, I mean, I do that too. I'm not gonna lie, but getting lower will definitely give you a, a different angle of view and give you a different perspective on how things look. So, uh, for example, today, uh, me and my dad, uh, we we like to go take photo walks together and 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 take you know just drive somewhere and go take photos um, and we were walking through it's basically a wooded area near an environmental center and uh, so we it, it had just happened to snow uh, a couple days ago and so there was snow still on the ground but the cl- the paths were cleared so uh, I was taking a photo and I, I just stood there and took a photo um, just eye level wasn't even worried about anything except getting the path right in the middle of the frame and so I took that photo, and it was like, okay, that's cool. You know, it's all right. And then I, I did bend down lower and kind of almost got on my knees, and I, I, d- I took the same photo. And it sounds like a stupid, simple tip, but, I mean, we all forget to do it. So I, I took the photo, and it was it was a whole lot better photo. Now, granted, it's not a photo I'm going to, like, print off and, and, you know, try to get in the Smithsonian or anything, but it just kind of shows you that, you know, doing this one stupid simple thing will change everything so it changes it changes the way you might look at certain things so um i've actually found it a habit of mine uh, sometimes especially if i don't have my tripod with me if i go to take a photo i'll automatically get on one knee and start taking photos and then then i'll i'll decide if that's too low if i need to go a little bit higher up and and that sort of thing so i know it sounds so stupid and simple but it's it's something that you know the simplest things we always forget so, uh, you know, next time you go out there, just, just try to get a, get a low photo. And, uh, that kind of brings me into my last thing that I wanted to talk about. And, uh, it's going to be a, um, a product of the week. And I did this a long time ago, but it's, um, it's something that I wanted to bring back, uh, for this one, at least because I'm talking about landscape photography and I call it a cheap product of the week because compared to other photographers out there who, who, I don't know how, how they do this, but. I have a budget that I got to work on for my photography. So, you know, they're out there getting, you know, uh, $150 tripods or $300 tripods and all this kind of stuff. I just can't do that. So uh, I was looking on Amazon and uh, I was looking at the tripod that I bought last because I really, really like the tripod. It's a, it's a great cheap tripod and it supports my Canon 6D with the, with the big lens on there. So it supports that. Um, it's got a ball head on it. It's got the uh, twist uh, twist release legs, and um, it's just a great a great tripod. And it's only uh, I think right now on Amazon, it is let's check here. It's only forty four dollars U S. So it's kind of crazy that this cheap tripod and it's th- to give you how show you how cheap it is. Um, cheaply named, it's not really cheap in quality. Um, it's one of those Amazon Basics tripods. Uh, I bought this a long time ago and it's, it's really, it's a really great tripod for being what it is. Um, there's the really great reviews on there for it. And so you can't just, you know, if you don't just trust me, trust the reviews. Um, 
it's just a really great tripod and i i don't understand you know un, uh, unless they have just tons of money floating around why you would want to go out and get a 300 dollar tripod i don't i don't get it um so uh, i wanted to share that with you guys to let you know that you don't necessarily have to get super super expensive gear you can really get some good cheap gear and it will last you it it obviously you're not going to be able to you know um put a 500 millimeter lens on there and have it work well that's not going to happen but if you have a 500 millimeter lens i want to borrow it <laughs> so um but yeah you're not going to be able to to put a heavy heavy equipment on there um but for what it is it's a really really great tripod so uh head on over to picturemonk.com slash pmp016 and uh, I'll put a link to that tripod there so you can, you know, if you're in the market for tripod, you can go ahead and check that out and see if you uh, want to pick that up for you. So, again, it's an Amazon Basics tripod. It's a 62-inch tripod um, with a ball head, and it does have the uh, the, the feature where you can spread the legs, um, all, th- all three legs out, and uh, it'll get low. So that kind of goes along with my, uh, my last tip there of, of getting low. So, um so that's about it. That's about it for the uh, the podcast this week. Uh, I just kind of wanted to run through a couple things. Um, not a crazy a crazy podcast like last week's was, but uh, those are just simple simple tips that not a lot of people talk about because a lot of a lot of uh, landscape photographers seem seem to talk about the same thing. You know, they talk about composition. They talk about um, certain gear like a shutter release or the bubble level or you know uh, tripods, real expensive tripods. Um, they talk about all that stuff, but they don't talk about certain uh, certain techniques of of really maximizing what you could do with your photography. So uh, that's about it. Again, go to picturemonk.com slash PMP016, and you can see all the stuff discussed in this episode. Remember to head on over to picturemonk.com slash podcast to rate the podcast. I would really appreciate that. Uh, that'll help me help me get up in the uh, in the ratings there, because um, right now if you search photography and uh, especially if you're on an iPhone, you got to scroll a heck of a long way just to see my little my little name. So uh, I'd really appreciate that, guys. Um, and uh, again, uh, thanks for listening. I appreciate it very much, and uh, I will see you guys in the next podcast. Have a good week. <laughs>